turn our eyes and our hearts toward the Lord Jesus Christ. This comes from Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 11 through 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised, promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, we uh, desire our time here this morning to be to the praise of your glory. Uh, we thank you for what you have done for us uh, in the work of Christ on the cross, in his resurrection from the tomb, in his sinless life for us. We thank you for the hope that we have secured for us in heaven. And we pray now that as we come before you, as we come to this time together, that it would be a time where our eyes are lifted from the cares of this world, refocused on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we would be encouraged and instructed by your word and through your spirit, that we, by grace, would be able to go from this place, having seen your glory, and then been changed to be more like Jesus. So we entrust ourselves to you this morning. and We ask for the work of the Spirit. And we do so with great confidence because we know that you hear us and that you answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. We get a chance now to sing praises to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite you to stand together, and we will sing of that cross where Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of me. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find.
Thank you. You can be seated. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Enjoying all the flowers? <laughs> How many of you have flowers in your yard? Yeah? Oh, pretty much everybody. Pretty much. <laughs> nice. We have, we have family coming in today, and I've been talking to my azaleas for weeks and telling them to shape up and stay strong. <laughs> and they have. <laughs> so I'm very thankful. Well, today we have, we're going to finish the New Testament. So I'm super proud of y'all. You've made it all the way through the New Testament by the end of this morning. So we'll go ahead and get uh, the first one up. All right. What does it look like these two guys are doing? Oh, okay, right. And what form of martial arts do you think they're using? Huh? Karate? Who said that? <laughs> You know what book of the Bible it is. This is judo, okay? They're practicing judo, and um, they are fighting over that trophy. Somebody wants to win that trophy. Who can squinch their eyes and see what that says? What, what does it say, Mariah? It says faith. So they're fighting for the faith. Um, Jude condemns. That means um, he tells certain people that what they're doing is a bad thing, okay? Jude condemns heretics who are set on dividing the church. Some people are in the church, and they want to Tear the church up, believe it or not. Um, and so Jude's saying, not good. Oh, here's a cool side note. I believe Jude is the half-brother of Jesus, I believe. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> James is his full brother. James wrote the book of James, and they were both half-brothers. There you go. They're both half-brothers of Jesus. So I always think that's a neat thing to think about when you think about somebody writing a book of the Bible. So Jude tells heretics, stop, don't divide the church. Um, he also challenges believers to pray and remain in God's love while waiting for Christ's return. And then finally, he asks us to reach out to people whose faith may be struggling. Sometimes you may have a friend and they're like, I don't know if I believe that part of the Bible. Well, instead of being hard on them, you could love them and you could reach out to them and maybe explain part of that, that Bible that they're struggling with, okay? All right, so there's Jude fighting for the faith, all right? So if you know your New Testament books, you know what this one is. So this man is pulling, this is uh, the Apostle John. What books of the New Testament do you think John wrote? I'll give you a hint. Think about his name. James? John. That's great. Is that what you're going to say, Tommy? Very good. So this is the only one he wrote that doesn't have his name on it. Um, and so this man is pulling back a curtain. So what, what do you do when you pull back a curtain? What are you doing? You're revealing something. And so this is the book of Revelation. All right? And if you see there on the sign, it says coming events. Uh, the Apostle John wrote this at the end of the first century. And he wrote to encourage the believers to stand, stand firm in the coming persecution. Persecution was coming, and he was trying to encourage them to stand firm and to remember that God will judge the persecutors perfectly, um, that he is coming again, and that heaven will be our home. So to summarize, if you look in your New Testament, it'll say revelation, but a lot of them says the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the theme of revelation. Um, and what a way to end the Bible. When I was a little girl, um, some preacher must have talked about when Jesus came back that the clouds would be rolled back as a scroll. And uh, when I was in first grade, I drove an hour to go to school. And I remember so many times looking out the window, and I would look at the sky, and I would look at the clouds, and I would see if they were like looked like a scroll. <laughs> so I've been looking for Jesus to come back since I was six. So I'm really excited. I can't wait for him to come. And I hope that that fever will catch with y'all. He is coming again. And that's our blessed hope. All right, Colossians 1.18. Let's see if we can remember this, our few motions. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus, the theme of Revelation, right? He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Colossians 1.18. Remember the theme of Colossians? Who can tell us that theme? Remember James? That's right. So that's who we're talking about there. Very good. All right, and then our big picture question. Y'all help me with this. You ready? Why does the church exist? The church exists to glorify God by worshiping him, 
showing his love and telling others about Jesus. Paul had shared the good news about Jesus in Corinth. Many people believed the gospel and they began meeting together as a church. After Paul left, he heard that the believers in Corinth were turning away from the gospel. Other people had come and taught them things that weren't true. These teachers led the Corinthians away from the one true gospel, and Paul was worried. So Paul wrote a letter to the church. Listen, Paul wrote, I care about you. I want you to be faithful to Jesus and remember the gospel. Paul knew that the people had been tricked by the false teachers, like a serpent in the Garden of Eden had tricked Eve. Eve had everything she needed, but she believed the serpent's lies and disobeyed God. The Corinthian believers had everything they needed, the good news of the gospel Yet they were turning away to listen to wrong teaching. I'm not a great speaker, Paul admitted, but I know what I'm talking about. Paul relied on God's power to share the gospel. He spent his life sharing the good news, even though it meant facing suffering. Paul didn't share the gospel to get something from those who listened. He told them about Jesus because he loved them. Paul wrote, I won't back down. False teachers are trying to spread different messages so that the good news about Jesus won't go out. These teachers are against God and they are only trying to take advantage of you. Paul spoke up because he knew the truth. If anyone deserves to be listened to, it's me. I've worked hard, been thrown in jail and beaten and nearly died to share the gospel. God had chosen Paul and had changed his life. Paul knew his suffering was worth it and he wasn't going to give up. I do all of this because God, the Father of the Lord Jesus, deserves to be praised. Sharing Jesus with the world is not always easy. There will always be some who try to stop the good news from spreading. God calls believers to follow and obey Jesus no matter what. All right. All right, so what does it look like those people are doing there to that person who's talking? Yeah, they're making fun of them. You know, one of the hardest things sometimes is when you do the right thing and you get mistreated for it. But I think if you remember uh, Jesus and the way he lived, he would go into communities and heal literally everyone. <laughs> and then there'd be the Pharisees giving him a hard time. But that's okay. Um, why should we keep sharing the gospel? First of all, we should share it because God's told us to. We're obeying his command. But then sometimes people might be hard on you when you're doing that. Why should you keep going even if you're mistreated? Can you think of the two greatest commands? Ella? That's right. What, what's the number one command? Can anyone remember that? The Shema? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? That's why you should keep going. But then remember to love your neighbor as yourself. So even when you get tr mistreated, you keep loving God and you keep loving others, and that will motivate you to keep going. We'll sing again a song that will help encourage that motivation to love God and to love others. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Would you stand together with me? We'll sing.
continue your prayers and your thoughts towards uh, our pastor, Pastor Chris, uh, who's out this week. Um, thankful for uh, the chance for him to be able to have a uh, brief break and uh, be able to just connect with his family and enjoy, enjoy that new little girl. So keep praying for them. I know they would appreciate it. Uh, this morning, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, you can make your way there, uh, and then uh, we'll get to uh, our text here in just a minute. Um, I have a favorite Mike Tyson quote. I'm not sure if you're allowed to have a favorite Mike Tyson quote or not, but I have one, right? <laughs> I have one. For those of you uh, younger folks in the crowd who do not know who Mike Tyson is, Mike Tyson is a boxer. Uh, and uh, at one point in his career, he was the most feared boxer of all time. He was uh, incredibly powerful and uh, was, was quite the competitor. So uh, my favorite Mike Tyson quote is this, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, it's, a, it's a great quote, right? It's a great quote for a lot of reasons. One, I think it's because it's a pretty astute observation about how life works in crisis, right? You might have a really good plan, and then life happens, right? You get punched in the mouth. Um, and when those plans kind of get kicked out the window, or things get aggressive quickly, then you have to start reacting, and your training and your habits are then reflected in how your life goes forward. And I think this is the concept that, that Mike Tyson was, uh, somebody was asking, I read a little bit of the context of the, the quote, but somebody was asking him about his upcoming fight with Evander Holyfield. And, uh, and he said, yeah, you can have all of the strategies and all the plans in place that you want to until you get punched in the mouth. Uh, and sometimes we can feel like that, right? Uh, and I think the introduction or the beginning to 1 Peter is a little bit like that too. It's a little bit um, uh, like a punch in the mouth. Uh, and maybe this morning as we kind of jump into this sermon, it might feel, or because we're going to get it personal a little quickly here, it might feel a little bit like a punch in the mouth, right? So I'm going to ask you a question. I don't necessarily want you to answer it out loud. I want you to answer it in your mind, in your heart, and just think about it here. Um, why, are, why are you here at church this morning? There's lots of potential answers for that, right? Because, uh, one of them, uh, this is just what I do on Sundays, right? Sunday morning, this is what I do, I come to church. Um, maybe it's because you need some social interaction, right? The, uh, the quarantine's got you down and you just got to see some people, right? I got to get somewhere so I can see some people. Uh, maybe I just needed to get out of the house. I've been stuck in the house all week, I got to get out, and uh, church is a good place for me to be. Um, maybe, kids, maybe it's because your parents made you be here, Right? That's, that's a pretty good reason, right? You don't, you don't have too many... Uh, Don raises his hand in the back. <laughs> Don's mom made him come this morning. Uh, so there's lots of different reasons, right? Uh, maybe, maybe some of it's because you, you love God and you think that God and the Bible are important and you want to worship him. And maybe it's not as simple as any single one of those. Maybe it's just a mixture of a lot of those things that have influence and tug on your heart, on, on your motivations of uh, why you're here this morning. Why, maybe let's refine that question just a little bit. Why should we be here this morning? Well, thankfully, we have it printed right here, right? We exist to proclaim God's glory and grace. We are here this morning. Uh, we exist as a church. We exist as individuals. We are here this morning to proclaim God's glory and grace. And I, I love this purpose statement. Um, but it's a little aspirational, isn't it? This is what we want, this is what we would like to achieve, this is what we would like to go to, this is what we would like to strive for, and while this should be the main reason that we've come here today, I think we can genuinely say, all of us, that we often struggle with our sin nature and we wrestle with our fleshly desires and maybe, maybe this isn't quite where we're at yet. I want to turn to 1 Peter because I think 1 Peter uh, one here helps encourage us towards some ends that will help us exist and live and worship to proclaim God's glory and grace. Okay, so let's read just a little bit here. We'll pray and then we'll dive into the text. First Peter chapter one, I'm just going to deal with the first nine verses. All right, so here's what Peter says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, <clears throat> excuse me, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has uh, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the, testing, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. You know our minds. You know why we're here. You know what happens on the inside. And yet you're still merciful and gracious. For someone who knows, who knows us better than we know ourselves, that is really hard to understand how you could be merciful and gracious to people like us, but you are. And you've saved us. And you've given us incredibly good gifts. And you have encouraged our hearts and caused us to hope in Christ. And so this morning we give you praise. And we ask for your help now. May your word and your spirit be encouraging to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peter opens up his letter here in uh, somewhat of this fast, get to the point type of uh, address, right? Uh, may, as something like, hi, my name is Peter. I know you're going through some stuff, but God is worth being praised. Right? He just jumps right into this. You have this in the first couple of verses. He, he gives a little bit of background. He tells who he is. But then really this, this premier and preeminent uh, address to the people, the first thing that he tells them, the first instruction that he gives them is, blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that God is worth being praised. God's worth being praised. But maybe you don't feel like that this morning. Maybe things aren't that great. Maybe life stinks a little bit or life stings a little bit. Can you genuinely come this morning and say, really genuinely, that God is worth being praised? Now, I think Peter begins to unpack this and helps us get to the point that we can say, yes, God is worth being praised. And he does that in a couple of ways. So let's ask the question, why? Why is God worth being praised today? Uh, it, verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, you have this initial command, God is worth being praised, and then he gives us the answer why. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here we are again. Three sermons in a row, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Really, I think time would probably fail us to spend enough emphasis and encouragement, to drain enough encouragement from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is exactly where Peter takes his readers first. And this is exactly where scripture points us first. Why is God worth being praised? Because he has been given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were dead in our sins, and yet God has made us alive. Just in the same way that God raised Jesus, God has raised us. Mercifully, God birthed us into a living hope. He rescued us from hopelessness and revived us to hopefulness. How is this even possible? Because oftentimes in our hopelessness, it doesn't seem that the, like there's a way out. Right? 
This is, the, this is the darkness of hopelessness. It doesn't seem like there's a way out. It seems like all is lost. It seems like sure defeat, and it seems like certain death. Now, again, this wouldn't make sense coming from Peter, right? Uh, remember the resurrection accounts, the end of Luke, or the end of all the Gospels. Who was one of the first ones to take off towards the tomb once he hears the message from the ladies? Peter. Peter. Knowing what he went through through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his uh, denial that he knew Christ, you can imagine the darkness of his hopelessness at that point, right? I've, I've just spent all of this time with Jesus, and in the moment when it mattered most, I denied that I even knew him. At the point in which, in my hubris, I said I would never deny him. At the point in which it mattered the most that I should stand for him, I gave up. I quit. I gave in. And yet it is this truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that ignites this spark of hope within Peter. And it's this that Peter reminds his readers of and uh, puts it into the scriptures so that as we look at this this morning to say, why is God to be praised? Because through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have hope. We have hope. All is not lost. It is not sure defeat. And death is no longer certain. Because Jesus Christ is alive. God secures our hope mercifully through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As Jesus' disciples forgot his teaching on the resurrection. What was the result? They were hopeless and afraid, right? Where, does the, where do the Gospels tell us they were? They were hiding up in a room, kind of closed off from everything, wondering what to do, uh, struggling with, with where things go from now. And here we find that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have this living hope. Now, biblical hope is nothing really like we think hope to be, right? What's our understanding of hope? Uh, usually, it's an expression of a lack of confidence or a desired expectation for the future that we don't really have an assurance that will happen, right? Uh, I hope the stock market goes up. Um, I hope my team wins. I hope we have chicken for lunch. I hope, you know, uh, who knows if those things will happen, right? Who knows? Who knows the future? All of those things, this is how we use the word hope. This is not how the scriptures use the word hope right? Peter condenses it within, specifically within chapter one, but it kind of leaks out in some of the other aspects of his, uh, his letter here. We're looking at the verse in, in verse three, where he says that Jesus' resurrection provides a living hope. Look down, just scan down to verses 20 and 21. You find this again, this concept again, where he says, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you through him, uh, for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. He turns them once again to the hope of the resurrection, that it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have this confident assurance that God is going to do what God said he would do. Uh, verse 13, he says, he says not only that it's the resurrection that provides a living hope, but it's Jesus' return that provides a future hope. In verse 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is this solid, confident expectation that is wrapped up securely in Jesus Christ. Not only his resurrection from the dead, but his soon return. And then it leaks out into another part of his letter that believing God's promises is an evidence of our own hope. In chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes this, But in your hearts, honor Christ, as the, Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. The hope that comes from the resurrected Christ and the soon returning Christ, ingrained within the heart of the believer, gives people a reason to ask you for this hope. 
look, the world around us doesn't want empty platitudes, doesn't desire, I hope that Jesus is the answer in the worldly sense of hope. The world around us needs and desires innately a confident expectation that something is sure, that something is guaranteed. So our biblic- uh, the biblical hope that we're talking about here is an inner confidence in the character and the work of God that expresses itself in faithful living. This is what biblical hope is. I know that God will do what God said he's going to do, and God will be what he said he's going to be, and so therefore I am going to live in obedience and worship to him. This is biblical hope. It has nothing to do with chance and has everything to do with confidence. And this is what Peter reminds us of here in this first section of 1 Peter. He says that we have our hope, a living hope, and it's anchored to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let let me try to illustrate this just a little bit. Um, How many of you uh, know who Alex Honnold is? Maybe I should ask it this way. How many of you saw the National Geographic documentary called Free Solo? All right, a couple of you. Okay, Alex Honnold is the climber in the documentary Free Solo. So Free Solo is a climbing technique where you don't use any ropes. It's also called insanity. (laughs) Just kidding. Um, But it is a technical aspect of climbing mountains without any kind of assistance, right? So Alex Honnold... Uh, accomplished an incredible feat just a couple of years ago. He free soloed El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Uh, it's a, uh, I think, a three or 4,000 foot granite slab cliff uh, in Yellowstone. Absolutely beautiful. He climbed the entire thing without any ropes, right? Now, this is, this is amazing. Now, if you get a chance this afternoon, uh, uh, look up his TED Talk. He gave a TED Talk about it, which is great. Um, or watch the free solo. If you're afraid of heights, it will make your palms sweat watching it, I promise. It, it, uh, you just, you see it and you just, the anxiety. So if you're afraid of heights, maybe don't do this, okay? Don't do that. But if you're interested in it, it's a great, uh, the TED Talk is really great. The free solo documentary is really great as well. Um, uh, a, a great uh, description of what he did to accomplish this feat of free soloing a three or 4,000 foot granite cliff. And he walks through how he overcame fear. Now, for uh, probably at least two or three years before he did this, uh, he spent those two or three years essentially memorizing the route up the cliff. He would go and he would, pra- he would go up to a certain point in the cliff. He would practice all the handholds. He would practice all the moves that he needed for that segment of the climb. He would move up to the next one. He did the same thing, and he did it over and over and over again. He actually went uh, right before he made the climb with one of his buddies. He rappelled down, and they cleared out all the rocks, the loose gravel and rocks from from the route. And he spent years preparing for this to the point where he had the entire thing memorized. He knew exactly at the hardest point of the climb, he knew exactly what his move was. He knew exactly where his foot would go. He knew exactly where his fingers would be. And he was able to climb the entire thing free solo from the bottom to the top. It was an incredible feat. He has this quote in his, te- his TED Talk, and it, the, the essence of his TED Talk is he says, this, was, this climb was mostly mental and not physical, right? I knew all the climbing holds. I knew the route. This was mental. This, this great quote, he says, doubt is the precursor to fear. He so said, I climbed that route fearlessly. Why? Because I knew something very clearly. I knew exactly where my next handhold is. I knew exactly where my next foothold was. I knew exactly, I was able to picture in my mind exactly what that route was going to be and everything I needed to do on the way up. He was not hesitant and he was not afraid. And although Alex didn't have any physical anchors to assuage his doubts and fears, he had a mentally prepared so that he had mental anchors that gave him the confidence to conquer something that had never been done before. I would suggest to you this morning that living life with biblical hope looks something like this. To the outside world, there doesn't seem to be anything anchoring us. It seems like 
were living insanely. Right? To the outside world, Alex was a little bit off his rocker. Right? But internally, our doubts and our fears have been crushed, and we can live with confident expectation that God can do and will do exactly what he said he would do. And he will be exactly what he said he was going to be. And he will be consistently good and consistently great. And so we can say that God, our Father, is worth being praised today because he gave us hope, the hope of life, and victory through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's worth our praise. There's a second reason here, I think, that Peter gives that we should come to God and be willing to give him praise this morning, no matter what. And that's because he's given us an inheritance. This is verse 4, right? Verse 3, we have set up for this, this incredibly powerful truth that we have the promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it anchors us in this confident expectation as to God's character. And then we have verse 4. Why can Jesus Christ be praised? Because we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and it's kept in heaven for us. We'll get into verse 5 in just a minute. But we have this inheritance. Now, let's, let's anchor this into a little bit of context first, and then we'll describe it a little further. First, contextually, remember back up in verse 1, Peter says, hey, I'm Peter, and I'm writing to, who's he writing to? He's writing to the dispersed saints, the exiles. These are the Christians, this first century Christians, who had been kicked out of their homes and their businesses and their communities because of their expressed faith in Jesus Christ. They'd been pushed out. They'd been pushed out of the Roman Empire. They'd been pushed out of their communities. They'd lost all kinds of things, including inheritances, including houses and lands. And Peter immediately turns to this and he says, hey, don't forget that God is to be praised. He's worth our praise because we have an inheritance. I think this would uh, register pretty significantly for these believers. We have an inheritance. Wait a second, what, an inheritance? I left all that behind. Now, I think there's an implication built within this. Some things that we, we know very clearly, one being well, the first implication is that to have an inheritance, you must be adopted or you must be a member of a family, right? You don't give inheritance to random people. Well, I guess you could. It's a legal nightmare. It doesn't usually happen, right? Your inheritance goes to your relatives. It goes to your children. It's passed down in the family. And this is precisely what Peter is drawing our attention to, that through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been welcomed into a family and given all the rights and privileges associated with being in God's family. I think this is why Peter uses this specific title of God. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's drawing our hearts and our minds to think of God in relational aspects. God is our Father, and through Jesus Christ, He has adopted us into His family. We are part of what He's doing, and we're part of that family. And because we're part of that family, we get the inheritance. We get the riches. And this is, this is part of what it means to be in Christ We've talked through a lot of those implications in our study on uh, Wednesday nights as to what it means to, to be united to Christ. Um, and in Ephesians chapter 1, we read it as our call to worship this morning, but it also uh, reflects this. And interestingly, uh, three concepts that, that uh, Paul in Ephesians connects, hope, glory, resurrection, return. He connects them in Ephesians chapter 1. Peter does it here too. Uh, this is part of what it means to be in Christ. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. In him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. 
We can praise God because we have this inheritance. We've been adopted into this family. This is the implication of what, what, what Peter says when he says you, ha you have this inheritance. The second implication I think that's here is the death of the loved one, right? Inheritances only happen when the loved one passes away. Um, and this reflects well with what's going on, on here in this text too because what did it take for us to have this inheritance secured? It took the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus' death that secures for us this inheritance, and then he goes on to describe it, that it's imperishable, it's lasting. It doesn't, it doesn't pass away, right? Everything that you pass down to your children, eventually something will happen to it, right? It's going to get spent, burned, uh, trashed, something is going to happen to it. But this, this inheritance that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ is, is lasting, it's undefiled, that means it's pure and unsoiled, it's unfading, that it endures, and that it's kept in heaven for believers, for those ones who have been made alive to this living hope. It's imperishable, it's un unfading, it's kept in heaven for us. If we skip over to Ephesians chapter 1, we find out some more things about this inheritance. It's in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14, it's secured by the Spirit. That the Spirit secures this inheritance for us. He is the guarantor of this inheritance or the down payment, if you will, of our inheritance. The Spirit of God testifies to us that we have hope because Jesus, because of Jesus. The presence of the Spirit with us reminds us of the future hope we have of the presence of God with us. The Spirit secures this inheritance. And then, uh, so you have a description of the inheritance. It's imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept in heaven. It's secured by the Spirit. And, it's, and then the description of the recipients. Um, you have there, verse 5, there's uh, for all you English people that like English, go through the prepositions from uh, 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 1 Peter chapter 1 here. In, through, to, I guess to is not necessarily a preposition, but here you have uh, verse 5. Uh, who, are, who have been kept in heaven for you. Who's the you? Well, those who, have, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Us believers, the ones who have their hope in Jesus Christ, we are being guarded by God's power. Our faith in the power of the hope of the resurrected Christ gives us incredible security. Now, I think we have one key question that we need to ask here, right? We, we've seen this description, or we've seen this inheritance described to us, what it's like, but what is it? What is it? Now, I think there's, there's probably multiple schools of thought. Some would say it's, uh, you know, heaven itself, right? Um, uh, all of the, the, the things that we will have there in heaven, right? Um, and al although everything about the place of heaven is going to be absolutely mind-blowing, I don't think we're going to marvel at that for all eternity, Right? So I think that may be a small part of it, but I don't think that's exactly what Scripture is, is directing our thoughts towards. And, and I think we're tempted to think, because of our materialistic minds, because of what we an understand in a context of inheritance, right? When we think of an inheritance, we think of something material, my passing down of my material possessions to uh, the generations to come. We think materially. So I think heaven may be a very small part of this, but I think it's something bigger than that. I think this inheritance, and I think the scripture would direct our, our minds this way. I think this inheritance incorporates two very key points. One, God breaking the sin curse. Right? Uh, he, uh, Paul speaks of it in Romans chapter 8. Right? The creation groans under the weight of sin, and we wait for the fullness of our redemption. Does that mean that we have sins that aren't quite forgiven yet or something like that? No. It, it, it's we're waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise to make everything new, to restore everything right. Peter says it here. We're looking for this future salvation. Uh, is it verse 5? Um, we're kept, we're guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What's that salvation? The, re the restoring of everything to its state that God intended it to be. 
God breaking the sin curse. Everything that's trashed by sin is going to be fixed. Every effect of sin that taints our existence will be erased. We're looking for that. We're waiting for that. But I want to take this one step further. All right? So I think there's a small part of this inheritance that, that may be heaven itself, the material parts of heaven itself. I think there's a greater part of this that is the crushing of every effect of sin and the eradicating of sin from every part of our existence. And then I think the third and most significant part of this inheritance is God himself. Restored, open fellowship with the one who made us. This is the inheritance because, as the psalmist puts it, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let me illustrate it. For those who have lost parents, how many of you would trade the stuff your parents left you for more time with your parents? I would, every day of the week. And maybe your parents weren't that great. God is the best parent that you would ever have. And I would trade every single material possession for one moment with him. This is the inheritance. Not only the glory of heaven, which reflects the glory of its creator. Not only the eradication of sin, which brings us to a point in which we can fully enjoy fellowship with our father. The restoration of all things. We're with him. And he's with us. And everything is right in the world. This is the inheritance. And this means that God is worth being praised. How could you not praise a God who does this? Verse 6. In this you rejoice. This is something that is worth joy. This is something that is worth praise. And we can praise our Father because, because He gives us hope, and we can praise our Father because He gives us an inheritance. And now we have to ask a really significant question. How? How do we do this? Maybe you've gotten to the point that through some of these explanations, you have come to the realization, yeah, I didn't quite come this morning with the right motives. They were mixed at best. And I need to change. I want my heart warmed. I need my affections changed. And this is where this biblical hope gets extremely practical. Because we have a living hope and an inheritance that we can endure difficulties for a little while. Right? Verse 6. In this we rejoice. Right? This incredible hope that we have through Jesus. He is praiseworthy. In this we, rejo we rejoice. Though... Now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. How do we praise God? Well, I think the first one is we joyfully endure difficulties that we face. Joyfully endure difficulties that we face. Again, let's, let's take some context here. Okay, Remember, Peter is writing to exiles. There's nothing that helps gain perspective than kind of comparing yourself to some historical points, right? This is one of those, okay? Um, we as believers in the United States of America, uh, 2021, we have things really good, really good, right? You say, well, you know, politics, right? Eh. We have things really good. There's not a one of us who walked here, I don't think, no, I don't think so, right? Not a one of us walked here. Not a one of us had to come under threat of life. We gather at this place every single week, right? We don't have to change locations. We don't have to hide from the cops. Every single one of us has access to the scriptures in multiple forms. Digitally, in print, 
the context in which Peter was writing this command that they would joyfully endure difficulties. He was writing to exiles who had been expelled from the homes, their homes because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They had lost possessions and position because of their faith in Christ. They were being persecuted, genuinely persecuted for their faith. Now there are people in 2021 who are genuinely being persecuted for their faith. How do your trials stack up? How often do we sourly complain about what God has put down our path? <laughs> I did this week, yesterday. I did. How often do we allow the minutia to suck the joy from us when it's really in comparison to both what other people are facing and to the glory that we will get? is small and insignificant. For a little while, for a little while, we may have to joyfully endure things, but these difficulties are a test of the genuineness of our faith. That's monumentally convicting because if these difficulties are a test of the genuineness of our faith, our complaining is an evidence of the fakeness of our faith. Growing up, uh, I lived in a small community, uh, Elko, Nevada, which uh, its greatest brag was its nearness to the largest open pit gold mine in North America. At the time, it may have been surpassed by now. Uh, and they've gone to underground mining there as well. But uh, it was a gold mine, like a, literally a gold mine. Now, they weren't taking like nuggets out of the ground there, which would have been really cool. <laughs> uh, but they weren't doing that. They were mining for microscopic gold. Um, they, would, they had an incredibly intensive process by which they would take out just massive amounts of ore from the ground uh, and put it in these, uh, uh, another cool thing to do this afternoon is you look up like the biggest dump trucks in the world. They had these biggest dump trucks in the world at this mine. They were massive, probably as tall, at least as tall as this building. The tires, a six foot man could stand up inside the inner rim of this tire and touch. These were huge pieces of equipment. And then, then you look at the, they had this um, electric shovel that would load these trucks. It was just, it was monstrous, massive. They'd move these massive amounts of gold ore to, a, to this incredible process where they would uh, leach it with chemicals and they would crush it and they would pull it along in this huge process and it would get to the end of the process and they would burn off, uh, part of the process was the microscopic gold would stick to steel wool in part of this process that they'd leach it through. And then they would have to burn off the steel wool, right? And so they had these huge ovens, essentially, that they would burn off the steel from the gold, and the gold would come out the end, right? This is a massive process, hugely labor-intensive. So much labor-intensive that they would never shut it down. Like, it, it ran 24-7, 365, no matter what, right? It cost more money to stop the process than to just keep it going. Why did they go through all of this intensive process of extraction and leaching and refining? Because it was valuable, right? Now, this valuable, they were, they, I think at one point, I think it was like an ounce of gold for every two tons of ore that they pulled out. That was just, whoa, that's crazy, right? Here's what the scriptures communicate to us. Our faith is so valuable that the intensive uh, persecutions or training or the disappointments or, the, or the, the troubles that come our way refine it to something incredibly valuable. Our joyful endurance demonstrates that Jesus is alive. It demonstrates that sin's curse is broken. Our, our, our joyful endurance demonstrates that the promised inheritance is worth it. It's worth it for the little bit that I have to endure here. What I'm getting there is far greater. It's far greater. And it results, uh, what does he say there in verse 6? It's, it's this, uh, uh, we, we, for a little while we go through these trials. We've been grieved by various trials, verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what this passage started with? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for who he is. And what does it finish with? Endure joyfully these, these difficulties because when you do, it's for praise and honor and glory. How do we praise God? Well, we joyfully endure the difficulties that we face. Two last ones. Verse 8. We praise God by loving Jesus even when we can't see him. Here's what Peter writes. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Effective, practical, life-impacting love of Jesus Christ is a demonstration that we are praising God. How do I praise God? Love Jesus even when you can't see him. Now, that's a very real task before us, right? Because we can't see him. And he's not here. And it does take faith. And it does take endurance. And it does take a continuing effort on our part to kindle our affections for the Lord Jesus Christ even though we can't see him. But we have every resource necessary through the grace given to us and through the scriptures that we have and through our brothers and sisters in Christ to continue to love Jesus even when we can't see him. We praise God by joyfully enduring difficulties. We praise God by loving Jesus even when we can't see him. And we praise God by believing Jesus with joy even though we can't see him. This is verse 9 or the end of verse 8 into verse 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Do you want to have that life-transforming joy that engages the community around you to ask about the hope that lies within you? You want that? Believe Jesus, even though you can't see him. Love Jesus, even though you can't see him. And joyfully endure difficulties as they come your way. Let's pray for God's grace to help us in that, okay? Father, We miss you. We love you. Can't wait to see you. But we know that by your wisdom and according to your power, you have us here now for purposes. We know that often uh, in our lives, some of those things are trouble. And some of it comes before, because we live in a sin-cursed world. And some of it com comes because we're still wrestling with sin in even our own hearts and minds. And so, dear Father, we praise you that Jesus is alive. Thank you for giving us hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you because of the inheritance that you have for us. And we so look forward to being done with this sin-cursed world. We look forward to the point at which you will make all things new, restored, right, every injustice made just, every tear wiped away, every sickness cured, all the old things done away with, and everything new and good. And we look forward to that. Thank you for that inheritance. Thank you for giving us your spirit that secures for us that inheritance, your promise, your, your, your presence with us that gives us this little foretaste of what it's going to be like to actually be with you in all fullness. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Lord, as we face difficulties, would you remind us once again to endure them with joy because we have hope, because we have you. 
they are filled with pain and disappointment, and it does affect us. But by your grace and with your help, would you help us to sorrow, not like others who don't have hope? Would you help us to uh, face the difficulties and the disappointments, not like others who don't have that hope? But I pray that you would anchor us firmly to yourself and give us the joy to follow you no matter what. Father, help us please to love Jesus even when we can't see him. Turn our uh, imaginations and our hearts towards him as we read of him in, in your word and help us to practically love him by being obedient to what you've said. Lord, help us to believe. Help us to keep believing. Secure us, please, in our faith when the doubts and fears would rock our boats. I pray, please, by the power of your spirit that you would anchor us to the truth of your word, that we would see you as bigger and greater, more glorious than all things, that we believe even though we can't see. Thank you for your promises which are true, and thank you for being with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We will close by singing praise to our Father. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a good week.